Sanctuary Columbus, what's up? I'm Keith Turner and this is my beautiful daughter, Avon, and we wanna welcome you inside another virtual worship experience. For those of you who don't know who Sanctuary Columbus is, we are a multi-ethnic church that is transformed by Jesus and united in service. And this week begins Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. I know, go ahead and you try it now. We wanna recognize all the contributions from our Asian Pacific Americans in the Christian community and all the impacts you all have made right here at our sanctuary community. We also wanna welcome all of our first time guests and visitors. If this is your first time, we would love for you to take a chance to visit our website. Hold on, let me make it appear. Boom, here it is, sanctuarycolumbus.com and fill out our digital connection card. Once you do that, one of our leaders will be sure to connect with you. We also wanna know how you and your family, your pets, how all of you all are worshiping with us today. Do me a favor, take a photo with your iPhone, hopefully, but with your smartphone, Post it to your Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and use the hashtag SCC everywhere. From one of those posts will be the church's first ever social media post of the week. Be looking for that coming up this week. Question, do you like waiting? I know I don't. Did you say yes? You know you tell enough tale. Uh, the truth is a lot of us can be impatient, and that's why this new sermon series from Pastor Rich will be just for all of us. It's called Life in the waiting room. Be sure to check out all these messages because you do not want to miss it. It's also Communion Sunday. Make sure you have your bread, your grapes, your juice, your crackers, and all of that ready. After today's sermon, we will all join together all across Columbus and remember what Jesus did for us. Now, as you're preparing those elements, let's join our worship team as we lift Jesus together in song.
Thank you, worship team, and thank you to everyone who joined in in worship as we lifted Jesus together. Here are a few things to keep in mind this week. Thank you for your continued faithfulness in giving. Remember, you can give on our website and on your smartphone with the Tithely app. Don't forget to use the benevolence option as that will go directly to our COVID-19 relief fund. Sanctuary groups are a great way to stay connected with your church family on a smaller scale throughout the week. And we're excited to announce we have two new sanctuary groups forming. And if you are not already connected with us and want to get involved, please fill out the digital connection card that can be found on our website. We look forward to connecting with you. We are excited about partnering with Chloe Inc. to provide some gift baskets for mothers in need. Chloe is one of our mission partners that walks alongside these mothers, providing them with resources and mentorship. We would like you to consider helping put together baskets that include toiletries, diapers, grocery gift cards, and other household essentials. If you would like to get more information about how to get involved, you can email our church administrator, Caitlin Steinbrecher, or you can fill out that digital connection card on our website and you will learn more. What's one thing we all can't live without and probably need a little bit more of? Some of you may have said chicken or Netflix, but I was thinking prayer. There are two opportunities to engage in prayer during this week. On Wednesdays, we have our midday prayer at 1230 on Facebook Live. And on Sundays, we have our Sunday night prayer Zoom call at 8 p.m. You can get information for all of those from the announcement graphic, and it's also in our weekly emails. This week, we want to say a special prayer for church leaders and their families as they continue to follow God and lead during these difficult times. And now I ask you to join me as we lift those up before our sermon. Lord, thank you for another chance for us to worship together. Even in spite of this COVID-19 pandemic, it's wonderful for us to worship together virtually. And now, God, we just want to lift up Pastor Rich and his family and all other church leaders, God, as they continue to follow you. God, I pray for clarity as they hear from you and that they just continue to lead with boldness and courage uh, in these difficult times. Thank you for their families. Thank you for their inspiration and thank you for their obedience. God, continue to bless them and continue to pour into them as they pour out to us. It's all in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let's join Pastor Rich for this first series, that's right, Avon, for this first message in Life in the Waiting Room. This is the day that the Lord has made. The psalmist said, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Praise God. I am so excited about today because we start a new sermon series for this month of May called Life in the Waiting Room. I can't think of a better time right now than to talk about this subject here. Uh, you probably heard that American prayer before. It goes a little something like this. Lord, give me patience and give it to me right now. Uh, the reality is few of us have embraced and live out fully the virtue of patience. Uh, we don't have a lot of patience for many things these days because we're so uh, used to having things quickly at our fingertips. Uh, we're used to downloads on the internet being lickety split. We're used to our food after it's ordered being delivered to our table very quickly. Not so much today because you got to go actually pick it up at carry out. Uh, we're not used to sitting at lights and waiting patiently for them to change another color, especially without doing something else in our hands or with our ears. Uh, we're so used to having everything at our fingertips that few of us feel like we can wait. I, I don't know if this is good news, but I did find that Dr. Larry Dosia, a, a Dallas internist, has come up with a diagnosis for this problem that we have with patients. It's called hurry sickness. It's for people who hate to wait uh, they suffer from uh, an increased sensitivity to the passage of time. Anybody out there got hurry sickness? Huh? Be honest. We got some hurry sickness folk out there. He believes that people suffering from hurry sickness will die before their time. There's an experiment, he says, you can see uh, and test if you have hurry sickness after all. Get a friend. 
uh, have them get a, a watch or a phone or something, something like that where they can uh, actually track the time uh, and have them blindfold you. And during the time that you are blindfolded, have them start, a, uh, start the timer and see how long it takes for a minute to pass. He says, for those who have extreme hurry sickness, just a mere 15 seconds will feel like one minute. 15 to 35 means you got mild, you know, sickness. And above 35 seconds, uh, you're, you're probably uh, not as sick as one might think you actually are. Uh, this hurry sickness is something that we're all too familiar with right now. Uh, we're used to living with our plates too full. We're used to living in the fast lane. We're used to not having enough hours in the day, days in the weeks, months in the year. We're used to running a rat race that even the rats can't win, y'all. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked about slowing down, but who can really slow down when you still got to be present on all of the video chats and conferences that you still have to have for work, for catching up with family, and trying to do life all together at the same time. The world continues to spin around us and it hasn't slowed down, but hurry sickness, if left undiagnosed and untreated and unchecked, will lead to some physical ailments. Things like ulcers and high blood pressure, tension headaches and high cholesterol, lowered resistance to disease even. And the eventual payoff for hurry sickness is heart attack. What the good doctor doesn't mention in his list of ailments is anxiety also increases in the heart of those who suffer from hurry sickness. But not just anxiety in their heart. The anxiety it creates for the spouse around them, for the neglected children around them, the, the frustrated animals that are around them, the deterioration that's happening in one's own spiritual life, and the character that starts to erode, leading to eruptions of all kinds. We think that if we do harder, work harder, faster, we will end up into some degree and level of productivity. But what we find is that many of us will end up earlier in the grave. The fact, brothers and sisters, is this. Most of us spend our lives waiting. Uh, we would, uh, some of us would rather do anything but wait. Some of us would rather do the wrong thing but wait. But most of life is spent waiting. Uh, waiting for that appointment to see the doctor. Uh, waiting to graduate. Uh, waiting to be accepted into some uh, college or internship program. Waiting to get that first job offer. Waiting to see if the bank is going to give you that loan. Uh, waiting for the right time to start a family, waiting for your test scores to come back, waiting for your loved one to come to Christ, uh, waiting for the Lord to bring you that right woman or man into your life, waiting to find out what God's purpose is for your life, waiting for someone to buy your house, waiting for someone to sell you their house, waiting for prayers to be answered, waiting for that spouse to come home from their short trip, waiting for that child to come home from their short date. Uh, uh, waiting is one of the hardest parts of Christian life, yet we spend a large chunk of our lives waiting for things to happen. Every green light feels like uh, five yellow ones and, and one yellow one feels like a dozen red ones. All we have to do is wait, but that's easier said than done. You know, it's one thing to wait on a traffic light. It's a whole completely another thing to wait on God. We're going to be in Acts chapter 1 today. Acts chapter 1 is written uh, by the gospel, uh, the same writer of the gospel of Luke. Uh, Luke wrote uh, gospel of Luke and then he wrote Acts sort of as a follow-up. And here's how he starts out in Acts chapter 1. Uh, verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up into heaven. And after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them 
and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but everybody say it with me, wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. And the church said, thanks be to God. Let it fill our minds, flow from our mouths, and free our hearts to live as the beloved children of God. Uh, the title of today's message is Gaining Weight. <laughs> Gaining Weight. Wait, how many of you, when you went to college, you gained the freshman 15, huh? Yeah, gained the freshman 15. How many of you in COVID-19 have gained the COVID-19? Uh, somewhere around there, maybe one, two, uh, five, uh, whatever it is. Uh, you've been gaining some weight, but the weight that God wants you to gain uh, is something that we can pull from this text. What we have here is the few days in the life of Jesus before he ascends to heaven. It's that mysterious period between his resurrection and the ascension where he shows up here and there to his disciples, some to just the remainder of the 12, uh, minus the one who committed suicide, uh, plus the others who were in Jesus's immediate discipleship uh, group, as well as hundreds of others who saw Jesus during this time. He appeared to many, and when he appeared to them, he talked to them or spoke to them about the future. And when Jesus spoke about the future, I can imagine it, it, it built all kind of anticipation and, and inspiration into the disciples. Uh, Lord, uh, what do you want us to do? And, and when are we gonna do it? How are we gonna get it done? Are Peter, James, and John gonna put together the 10 the year strategy? Uh, you know, is, is Matthew gonna make sure our accounting is all right? Are Martha and Mary uh, gonna be the, the disciples who go and preach out into the land as you have chosen them to do when they showed up at the tomb. Uh, God, how are we going to reach this whole world with your good news? All of these questions, I'm sure, and anticipations were in the disciples' minds as they were thinking about the future. And sometimes it's thinking about the future so much that uh, hinders the weight gain that we're able to be afforded right now. Here's something that I think God wants to do for us as I think he wanted to do in those disciples. That God wants us to gain a new perspective on what matters and particularly what matters to God. Uh, in Acts chapter one, verse four, it says that Jesus commanded the disciples to stay put in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was hot at the time. Uh, this was right after the crucifixion. And so uh, the Roman Empire is looking for any remnants who would lift up the name of Jesus for fear of there being some kind of rebellion. Uh, the Pharisees were looking for the remnant of Jesus followers so they could call them out and report them to the Roman Empire for being some kind of defactors. Uh, there was a lot of hot activity happening in Jerusalem. So I can imagine when the disciples heard Jesus say, stay put, that all kinds of emotions started to go on in their lives. Uh, they started to ask about what matters. And uh, hey, my life matters right now, Jesus. I don't know if I can stay here. I need to get out. I need to break up on out of here. Jesus, I can't wait right now and stay in Jerusalem. I, I got family I need to get to. I got friends I got to connect with. I got a job that's dependent on me tomorrow. I can't wait here right now. All Jesus told him to do was stay put. If it was my grandma, she would say, sat down somewhere, not sit down, sat down somewhere and keep yourself still. Don't go no where 
had the disciples left, it, it might have shown a, a lack of trust in Jesus at the time. It might have revealed a fear about what would happen if they were found out. It might even also reveal some kind of a weakness in their faith that they could not uh, believe that their master would take care of them by commanding and telling them to wait. Because God wants us to gain a new perspective on what matters. Are you gaining a new perspective on what matters right now? Are there some priorities that are getting rearranged in this season of your life? That's what waiting does. Waiting helps us to gain a new perspective on what matters. It helps us to get our priorities in a proper order in terms of uh, what we put our hope and our faith and our trust and our love in. Uh, brothers and sisters, if we still got our priorities mixed up now the way they were mixed up before this season, then we're not gaining the proper weight. Uh, God wants us to gain some new weight here by having a perspective that does not depend solely on us, but a perspective that depends solely on God. You've probably seen some of uh, some of the folks out there protesting, you know, they're like, look, I got to get out of this. I've been quarantined for too long. I'm not waiting any longer. I'm protesting the government. Give me my job back. Give me my life back. Give me my gym membership and my beauty salon back, please. There can't be no more self COVID cuts happening in my life. And all I got to say to those protesters is this. Can y'all please just wear a mask while you're out there protesting? <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, it, being quarantined and, and forced to stay put disrupts our comfort zones. It, it questions what we are putting our comfort in. Jesus said, Y'all stay quarantined in that room until I say it's time to come out. I don't care if Keisha come knocking on the door. You tell Keisha, bye girl, I ain't coming out of here until Jesus say it's time to come out. Stay here. Stay put until I tell you it's time to leave. Now, here's what happened with the disciples that after Jesus told them to stay put until it's time to leave, they had some questions. Acts chapter one, verse six. Then they gathered around him and they asked him, all right, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Who's got questions right now? Yes, I got questions. Every week, it seems like my list of questions keeps growing and adding up, and I'm sure their list of questions was adding up to when are things going to finally change around here jesus when are we going to take up arms and storm the the roman empire when are we going to take up arms and storm the synagogues when are we going to get to do the spirit stuff again the healing the preaching the powerful prayers you know the fun stuff and jesus's answer to them is this it is not for you to know the times or the dates the father has set by his own authority. Jesus said, hey, this ain't even my authority. It's the father's authority. When the father is ready to do all of that stuff you dreaming about, when the father is ready to do all of that stuff that you making plans for, he'll let you know. He'll let you know. You on a need to know basis. Right now, the way we say it in my house is when the kids be asking questions because they be asking all kinds of questions, y'all. They be asking questions all the time. What's for dinner? When we going to eat dinner? Can I have this to drink? Who's that on the phone? Who's that at the door? When, we Sometimes we just tell them, look, none ya. None ya. Now, the older ones, they know and they can they can help the younger ones figure it out because for a long time, they just be like, who's none ya? Is daddy talking about Auntie Yana? Is he talking about Auntie Auntie Delane? Is he talking about Auntie Heather? Who is Daddy talking about? Who is Nunya? And finally, the older ones will tell him, Nunya is none your business. Hashtag none your business. The timing of things are in the hands of God. And the reality is this. There are some questions that lead to our gain 
and some questions that lead to our loss. Uh, there, there's some uh, newer questions that God wants us to, to gain out of this experience. And some of those questions lead to us being built up, stretching our weight and others uh, shrinking and lowering our weight. God wants us to ask the right set of questions. So here's some questions that uh, lead to weight loss. Weight loss questions of impatience. How long... Will I be in the waiting room? How long, God, will I be here? How long we got to stay here, God? Uh, Shala, in my favorite verse uh, to live by is Proverbs 16 and 1. We humans make plans, but it is the Lord who decides what will happen. I'm supposed to make plans, but God, you determine how long. I don't know. Uh, we ask the question, this is a weight loss question. God, why are you doing this to me? We think everything, ha we, we look at COVID affecting the whole world and we say, God, why are you doing this to me, God? I know it's 6.8 billion people in the world, God, but why me? That's how heavy the weight feels sometimes. But God tells us through Christ in Matthew 5 that he reigns on the just and the unjust, that there is things that are happening to everyone. Somebody said, we're all in the same boat you know, in this storm. I don't think we're all in the same boat, but we're definitely in the same storm. We're all experiencing the uncomfortability of this season and it's affecting economies, it's affecting relationships, it's affecting relationship with God. God, why are you doing this to me though is not a helpful question. God, uh, what did I do to deserve this? We, we think, uh, when we ask this question, we still think, that we can work our way into God's good grace. And if we do some work that's bad, then God's got it out for us. Jeremiah 29, 11, y'all, you know, some of y'all know that verse. It's your favorite verse. Behold, I know the plans that I have for you, plans to do you good and not harm, to prosper you, but not just you, for the whole community around you. You didn't do anything to deserve this. It's because God has a plan and a purpose and then lastly, God, will you come through for us? God, will you come through for us? You told us to wait. You told us to stay. You told us to be still. You told us to sat down. But will you come through for us? Uh, the way he told it to the prophet Isaiah is that those who wait upon the Lord in time will renew their strength. They will mount up on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Yes, the strength will come, the weight will be over in God's time. These are weight loss questions of impatience, brothers and sisters. But there's also weight gain questions of importance. These are some questions that I think that God wants to reintroduce into our lives and to get us to think about, Lord, is there something you want to show me about your character? God, is there something you want to show me about your character. Uh, what is it that God is revealing right now? I believe that revelation right now is happening, uh, maybe even at an all time high around the world. The character of God, the person and personality of Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit's presence is being revealed into those who have an ear to hear who are close enough to listen, whose eyes are open enough to see. God is revealing God's self during this time. Number two, how can I become more loving towards God and others while I wait? Jesus said the greatest commandment of this is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love your neighbors as yourself. So God, during this time, while I'm waiting, how might I love you more? How might I love you deeply? How might I love others more and love them more deeply during this time? And number three, the one that gets me every time, Lord, what needs to change in my life at the heart level and not just at the surface level? Y'all brothers and sisters know when you go to the weight room, you can't just do three curls and expect to get any weight gain. You got to put in work 
deep work. You got to cross train. You got to stretch yourself so that the change can actually develop and take place in your life. Lord, what needs to change at the deeper heart levels, not at the surface level? I'm saying, God, take your time to let us come out of this season because I know there's some hardness in my heart that needs to be softened. I know there's some rough ground that needs to be tilled over so that you can plant some new seed in my life and see some spiritual fruit and growth that comes that will be a blessing to my family, a blessing to my church, a blessing to my community. But God, you got to do some work on me. Lord, what needs to change in my life at a heart level? And then number four, is there someone I need to share this experience with who is also waiting? God's got us in this place, not just for us, but for others. I guarantee you, though, God is moving slower than you ever will. You pray and you don't get what you want. And you ask, how long, God? How long I got to wait? Five minutes? Five days, five weeks, five years, the disciples who were told to stay in this room had no idea how long the wait was going to be. God, is it a few days? Is it a few weeks? Is it a few months? Is it a few years? We are tested in our wait during the seasons and times when God tells us to be still so that we might gain a new perspective on what matters, but also gain a new set of questions. And the best part is happening next in our story. Verse eight, but you, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Come on now. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after he, Jesus said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid them from their sight. Uh, God said, listen, after all of this, I've got something even better for you than myself. Brothers and sisters, the biggest gain comes after you've been in the weight room. Ah, that's good. That's good right there. Come on now. Come on. The biggest gains in our lives come after we've been in the weight room. I wish I had somebody who, who lifted weights right now to tell you the story of how the weights don't grow in the weight room. They actually grow after the time you spent in the weight room during the time of rest. That's when your weight starts to grow. That's when your muscles start to grow. That's when things start to change shape. It's after you've been in the weight room that you start to see the difference. All of that work you put in the weight room starts to show up outside of the weight room. The biggest gains come in your life after you've been in the weight room. Come on, somebody. Jesus told them, what's on the other side of this weight is more of God, not less of God. Uh, God had already given Jesus what's better than the person of Jesus, the presence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus could only be uh, seen and heard by a few in comparison to the whole world, but the whole world could receive the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, there's something better than my presence. It is the present gift of the Holy Spirit that is gonna come not just on you, but be in you. That spirit is gonna give you strength. That spirit is gonna give you power. That spirit is gonna give you courage. That spirit is gonna give you endurance. That spirit is gonna give you patience. That spirit is gonna give you everything you need and more as you go through life but not until you wait for it. Uh, turn to somebody next to you. If you're sitting down on the couch or in the chair or even watching in the car, turn to them and tell them, wait for it. Yeah, you got somebody sitting in the back seat behind you, go ahead and tell them too. Tell them, wait for it, wait for it. God says the biggest gains come after 
you've been in the wait room. That's where we are today. Life, life in the wait room. Some of you are there right now and you are not a follower of Jesus Christ. You are not a follower and you say, listen, I've heard the stories before. I've prayed the prayers before and I haven't seen the change yet. But what difference is it going to make now? The difference is when you put your trust in Jesus, what Jesus gives you is his Holy Spirit that enables you to wait with greater strength and with greater patience and with greater purpose. Uh, for those of you who say, uh, I can't wait much longer. I'm stuck. I I've been praying those prayers. I've been dreaming those dreams. I've been wondering, is it a waste of my time or is it worth the energy to try and try again? You've been waiting for months or years and already you feel like giving up. Don't leave the wait room until you got God's gift for you. Don't wait until uh, don't don't wait before uh, until don't don't leave uh, before the strength comes to you. It's on the way. It's right there. It's right around the corner. And, and I don't know how God is going to answer your prayers. I don't know if he'll answer them the exact way you're praying them. Those of you who are praying for something specific, you're praying for the specific job, you're praying, you're praying for the specific child, you're praying for the specific home. I don't know how God's going to answer you. But I do believe what he always promises to give, he doesn't take back. If he promised to give you his Holy Spirit, he will come through for you. Now don't, don't try to take matters into your own hands. Uh, don't be in such a hurry that making any decision is better than waiting. Brothers and sisters, hold on. Hold on to Jesus in the waiting room. Uh, there are those uh, who've heard the, the stories of Abram and Sarah who were old in age and waiting for their child and they took it into their own hands about how to bring that child into the world but it was still not a part of god's plan when abraham uh turned a hundred and sarah was 90 years old they brought the promised child into the world god god is faithful he's faithful to keep you right where you are uh, i think that uh, while these disciples were in the waiting room, uh, God had given them the instruction to wait. And while they waited, they called on the name of Jesus. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe it was Bartholomew who just kept calling out, Jesus, 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 something about that name and, and maybe some uh, somebody else was on the on the other side uh, uh martha or, or, or judith was was over there saying come lord jesus come come lord jesus come Man, if we was in church today, oh, we'd be singing some of these songs. We'd be calling people down to the altar. We'd be laying hands. We'd be praying for the Holy Spirit to come. And maybe what God wants to say today is that he doesn't need an altar in the church. He just needs an altar in your heart. He just needs you to make some space in your heart. He just needs you to make some space in his life. And his spirit will come and dwell with you let us pray heavenly father i thank you for uh the gift of your spirit i thank you god for uh, the presence that comes lord from your present to us uh, jesus there are many of us who are not just in a metaphorical weight room uh, we are in uh, weight rooms of great challenge and great distress 
My prayer, God, is that you send your spirit to comfort them. For those who are not yet followers of Jesus, God, I pray uh, that you would show and reveal yourself strong through the person of Jesus, that in that sweet surrender, there is a gift of peace and patience that is available to them. God, as we wait, we wait in hopeful expectation that you will exceed what we could ask or think. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. We're going to take communion right now. So as you prepare your bread and your cup, I believe that it was also something they practiced in that room. Because Jesus taught the disciples before he passed away on the cross that as often as you take this bread and you take this cup, you remember me until I come again. Uh, maybe they took communion, the Lord's table, daily as they prayed. Maybe they took it at every meal with the anticipation that Jesus was going to walk through the door at any moment. While they waited, they remembered. While you wait, while you wait there in your home, while you wait there on Zoom calls for on no end, uh, sometimes put in the waiting room, <laughs> may this come back to your mind to remember that God is faithful. For on the same night that Jesus took the bread, he broke it with his disciples and he said, this is my body. If I can get the thing open. <laughs> There we go. He said, take this bread. And he broke it. And he said, this is my body that is broken for you. Take and eat all of it. And in the same way, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is my blood shed for you. And a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Take and drink all of it. My daddy used to say that after the disciples took communion, the bread and the cup, they broke out in song and they celebrated. And may God give a new song to those who wait upon the Lord, a new song for the spirit of heaviness, a new song for the mental stress, a new song for the anxiety a new song in this season of waiting. God bless you, church. I'm praying for you to gain some weight in the month of May. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Rich, for this morning's message. Remember, Sanctuary family, to connect with us all week long on social media. Use the handle at Sanctuary Cebus on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter so we can continue to connect all throughout the week. Also, don't forget to pray for those church leaders, Pastor Rich and Shal and his family and other church leaders. Let's continue to lift them up in prayer. Family, take care. Continue your social distancing. Sanctuary, we look forward to seeing you all next week.